Hi folks, this is Alan here again, um, and this time I'm going to do a slightly longer format video that explains a little bit about the different types of digital to analog converters, what they all are, and actually why what the pros and cons are of each different type, because they are quite radically different. Now, the one I'm designing here is a single bit DAC. They're also called various other things. I think Technic's called them MASH, Philips called them Bitstream, um, but the, the overwhelming term is single bit, or actually uh, um, Delta Sigma D to A converters, and that's essentially what I'm building. But actually, to start with, I'm going to talk a little bit about the other type of DACs, what are called so-called multi-bit DACs. And the vast majority of these use a circuit that looks a little bit like this, which is called an R2R ladder DAC. Right, so essentially, by switching in different combinations of resistors here, those kind of input signals labeled D0, D1, D2, by basically setting those signals to high or low, you can actually generate virtually any output. And this is the simple circuit schematic of an 8-bit DAC. A 16-bit DAC is very simple. You just add another 8 of these on the end of it, and so on and so forth. Now, in theory, they're great. However, there are some practical problems with R2R DACs. So the first thing is most discrete resistors, most resistors that you get, such as the ones I'm using on this circuit board here, um, are typically about 1% accuracy. Um, and that just about manages an 8-bit DAC OK. But really good precision resistors are only 0.01%. And the problem is that that's just one-tenth of the accuracy needed for a good 16-bit DAC. 16-bit resistors, 16-bit uh, uh, DACs need resistors that are matched to 0.001%. And if you're going all the way up to 24-bit DACs, which is actually what I'm running here with my Delta Sigma DAC, it needs to be matched to 0.00006%. This gets even worse when you realise that resistance actually varies with temperature, so every resistor in your DAC needs to be at exactly the same temperature, uh, which in a box where heat is generated by virtually every component is nigh on impossible. So discrete components R2R DACs are likely to be pretty compromised in real life, and that's why manufacturers tend to make DAC chips like the very well-regarded Burr-Brown PCM1704, which I know name used fairly heavily, and it's used uh, in a lot of other high-end circuits. And, and actually, those there, the resistors, can be precision matched at a time of manufacture. There is a technique that some people have tried to use to further reduce distortion by using multiple relatively low-cost DACs on top of each other. And the theory behind this is that non-linearities and distortions in one chip will be cancelled out by averaging the output across several DAC chips. The problem is that the chips are made in the same factory, on the same production line, often in the same batch. So more often than not, they've got exactly the same non-linearities. If you're working with really cheap DAC chips, you may get some improvement, but this technique really isn't doing a lot with low quality uh, for good quality chips. And that's one of the reasons why um, the other type of the other major type of DAC, the Delta Sigma um, DAC, was invented. And as I said, there's various other names for this. This one um, uses a, a chip by Philips called a Bitstream chip. And there's you can make one bit mash DACs. They're all basically examples of Delta Sigma, as is my DAC. And in a way, it's actually a way of encoding a multi-bit signal into a one-bit data stream. And actually what I've got on this illustration here is the, the actual data signal is the second line up, line two, um, and that's a 24-bit, 352.8 kilohertz uh, um, audio data stream. And the two above that are simply a way of representing exactly the same data with just a single bit. But it typically runs at much higher frequencies. And that allows it to hold the same amount of information. And the output is then coded as what's called PDM, pulse density modulation, where a large number of logic 1s equals a high voltage output, uh, and a large number of logic 0s equals a low voltage output. And I'll see if I can kind of show that a bit by kind of turning the, the sampling rate down on this thing a little bit. And then if I just pause that, you can sort of see, if you squint at this, that on this side here, you've got a little bit here where there's kind of more highs and not quite so many lows, and then kind of go along a little bit further here, there's a bunch of lows and not quite so many highs, and everything in between. So if you kind of squint at this, you could see that it's not impossible that that could, when passed through an analog filter, produce some kind of analog output waveform, and it, indeed it does. So... Um, <clears throat> The exact output um, is dependent on, uh, on, on resistor values, but actually it's very, very much de more dependent on... Uh, it, sorry, the exact output isn't actually dependent on resistor values in this case, but it is extremely dependent on timing. So if you think about this trace that we've got here... If I change the oscilloscope in the correct direction... <laughs> So every single one of these bits here, up here, is going to be converted into an analog voltage. And basically, although the actual resistor values that we showed in the R2R DAC aren't particularly used, 
the thing that is really important here is the width of each of any, and every single one of these pulses. If every pulse is just a little bit too wide, then that's going to be interpreted as one and a bit pulses instead of one pulse by the analog filter. And similarly, if the, if the lows are a little bit too low, that's also going to be interpreted. So actually, that means that for this type of DAC, although resistor value matching is not really a problem, timing is absolutely critical. So Pink Triangle in their Decapo DAC, which is this thing over here, uh, they aimed to get 10 picosecond accuracy in the timing and they pretty much achieved that. However, I want to achieve much, much better. So in my current DAC here, I'm using crystal oscillators in this corner here with their own specially matched power supplies and very, very low noise power supplies. And that will give me down to about one picosecond accuracy of timing. And I'm actually working with a UK chip manufacturer, a UK clock crystal manufacturer, which will give me crystals that give me down to 0.05 picoseconds, 50 femtoseconds of phase accuracy. So basically, you have to choose when you're designing a D2A converter where you want to compromise. With an R2R DAC, resistor matching is absolutely critical and it's virtually impossible. And in a Delta Sigma DAC, timing is absolutely everything. I picked Delta Sigma since the state of the art in timing has improved immeasurably over the last few years, mainly due to advances in digital electronics used for mobile phones, computers, etc. I've also found this technique can sound very analog and very smooth compared with the somewhat clinical sound you can get from other types of DAC. Now, some high-end DACs actually use a hybrid technique. They use Delta Signal with multi-bit output, e.g. 3 bits, 6 bits, 7 bits I've even seen, where the DAC operates at high frequency using pulse density modulation. But, again, it keeps, it's particularly useful for high sampling rates since it keeps the maximum speed for the Delta Sigma DAC down to something manageable. But the question is, is it better when most of our source material is actually 44.1 kHz? I have to say, I'm not quite convinced. So I've designed my DAC to be as good as possible for 44.1 kHz material, and I'm really looking forward to hearing how this works. Thank you for listening.